Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Ellen Sandal. I'm the Greens Deputy Leader in Victoria and Spokesperson for Climate Change. And today we're running a webinar with myself and Chris, um, next slide, with myself and Sarah Mansfield. Uh, Sarah is our Greens MP for Western Victoria. You may know at the last election in November, we had a very successful election here in Victoria and elected eight Greens, doubling our numbers, including some seats, including winning a regional MP for the very first time in Western Victoria. And so many of our coal and gas projects, of course, affect regional communities because that's where they're located. So Sarah will be providing that perspective and talking to us a little bit in the middle of the presentation. I also would like to acknowledge that today I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri Warrung country, acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, that there is a lot more work to be done for true justice for our First Nations community and something that the Greens are very much committed to, um, treaty, truth and voice. If you would like to put in the chat which country you're joining us from, that would be very welcome. So today we are here to talk about a new coal project that the Victorian government is supporting. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Uh, which is pretty mind blowing actually, uh, to think that here in Victoria, a supposedly progressive state, that we are still supporting coal and gas, particularly given what the IPCC said last year that developed economies just simply must leave coal and gas in the ground and we're seeing some really concerning reports about Antarctic and Arctic ice melting at a rate faster than anybody predicted and the dire consequences of that and also reports that we're heading into another few years of El Nino bringing potential bushfires drought and and all the devastation that that brings in Victoria so it is a scary time and to think that any government is continuing to support coal and gas is pretty mind-blowing. But here in Victoria, this is literally the plan. So you can see on this map here that we have coal power stations running until after 2030 and the Labor government actually extended their licences. We have uh, seismic blasting about to kick off in the Otway Basin looking for gas. We have gas drilling opening up right across our coastline, particularly in Western Victoria, including gas drilling near the 12 Apostles. We've had the moratorium on gas drilling across our land onshore lifted by this Labor government. Uh, we've had a gas import terminal proposal at Correo Bay. It's been sent off for some more study, but it, it's something that is, is on the horizon. A new gas plant just approved at Western Port Bay. And of course, this new coal project, which we're going to talk to you about today, which uh, you know, gas is a devastating fossil fuel, but we ha also have the dirtiest coal in the world here in brown coal. And to think that a government wants to open up more brown coal is pretty mind boggling. So this is a very bad idea. In fact, it's every bad idea, lots of places all at once. So I want to go through today just, to, this will be quite technical, but I think it's important that we understand what it is. And then at the end, we will talk about how we can stop it because the good news is that this is very stoppable. We have a plan and we think we really can knock this off. So uh, we know that the, the Labor government, I want to acknowledge also, has done some really good things on renewables. They do have big plans for renewable energy. Offshore wind is a new technology that, that they're supporting, that they have targets for. We have a decent renewable energy target. We have a decent emissions reduction target. We're bringing back the SEC for publicly some publicly owned generation. But actually the thing we also know is that you cannot put out the fire with one hand by continuing to pour fuel on it with the other. And that's exactly what we're doing if we continue to burn coal and gas. Uh, and this is probably one of the worst projects that, that you could think of when you think about brown coal. Short of building a new brown coal thermal power plant, this is a pretty close second. So now I'll get a little bit into the, the details of it. So this project has three major components. The first is a, a new hydrogen production facility at Loyang plant in the Latrobe Valley which uses coal gasification to create hydrogen from brown coal. 
So essentially turning brown coal into hydrogen gas in the Latrobe Valley. And that means an expansion of coal mining in the Latrobe Valley for that purpose. The second part of the project is then liquefying that hydrogen gas at the port of Hastings Terminal and shipping it to Japan. And the third part is that the government says, don't worry, it won't contribute to our emissions because we will simply use carbon capture and storage to store all the emissions. Next slide, please, Chris. So where did this project come from in the first place? There was a project, it began in 2018, so four or five years ago, uh, and this was a pilot project to see whether this could work. Turn your sound and, on. Okay. Did sorry, somebody, somebody isn't on mute, so if you could just please mute yourself. Amy maybe has, um, has the controller of this that you could do that. Thank you. Yep, I can hear them. So just remind everyone, please put yourself on mute. So this project began as a pilot project in 2018. Um, it was a pilot project that was um, funded by the jointly by the state and federal governments. Each government, so that's our taxpayer money, gave $50 million to this project. And it had a target of turning, um, creating 2.6 tonnes of liquid hydrogen from um, brown coal. And someone's just put in the chat, what does HES stand for? It's the Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain Project. That's technically the name of this project, um, the Brown Coal to Hydrogen Project. Um, so it started um, off as a pilot uh, and then the pilot finished last year um, with the delivery of that hydrogen to Japan. And now they're in discussion for the commercialization phase of that because they say that the pilot has been so successful but we'll talk about that in a minute so the commercial phase has a goal of 225,000 tons of hydrogen per year uh, and it will probably be in the 2030s so next slide please chris we'll go through some of the details about uh, how this actually works and what kind of technology that they're using. So this is the HESC project. Now, don't worry too much about reading all the, the small details, but I will just quickly talk you through um, what they're proposing to do. So you can see here, this is the project from start to finish. And this is, this is the pilot, but the commercial phase is just scaling this up. So we get coal, brown coal, the dirtiest in the world. Uh, we gasify it. We refine that gas, supposedly capture those carbon emissions and bury them under the ground. We then transport that gas to the port of Hastings where that gas is liquefied. Um, and then we put it on, uh, we ship it to the port, um, put that on a, on a carrier, uh, ship it to Japan for unloading and use. And as you can see from this diagram at the end, right down the bottom in the bottom right hand corner, it says hydrogen produces uh, only water as an emission. So supposedly hydrogen uh, made in this way is clean, this wonderful technology that produces water um, only. Sorry, stop, Chris, can you please go back? Um, only water as an emission. There are several problems with this, and I'll just go through them slowly so that Chris can keep up. So, one. Chris? One. Great. Um, the problem is it created actually very little hydrogen. It only created one tonne. Its goal was 2.6 tonnes, but they actually had to buy the extra 1.6 tonnes from another project um, that was using hydrogen um, made out of methane. So actually it didn't even, it couldn't even produce the small amount that it said. Two. Chris, two. 70% of energy in making the hydrogen from brown coal was actually lost during conversion and transport. So I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, Chris, next. So this bit here around the truck on the third circle, you can see that that, that uses um, 
there's emissions from the gasification of coal, but then there's emissions in this transport. Um, Chris? Then there is emissions in the um, in the shipping, uh, huge emissions in the shipping of the hydrogen, also on a somewhat related matter. Actually, there was a fire on board that ship uh, as it approached Japan, a, a fairly minor fire that was put out, but given the potential um, for catastrophe, a, a pretty significant issue. Next, Chris. Um, also, the project purports to use carbon capture and storage to store the CO2 created from the gasification in offshore wells. But as we know, uh, they, they're proposed to use another government funded project here in Victoria called CarbonNet, which is essentially injecting carbon into disused oils wells um, off the coast of Gippsland. Uh, but as we know that this is a, a technology that has not been proven at this scale anywhere in the world. So Really, the government is relying on CCS to capture all the carbon from this project and saying that it will be carbon neutral, that it won't add to our emissions. But in fact, we know from the WA Gorgon Chevron gas project that they said that they could capture 80% of their emissions. They captured less than 40%. And there are other examples around the world where long-term storage of carbon in these kinds of wells is really in doubt, evidence showing that you can't store it long term. So a very risky, very unproven technology at this point. Uh, next. Um, and then down the bottom here, um, you'll see that this for this pilot project, they didn't even attempt to capture their carbon emissions. They just bought offsets to say that this pilot project was carbon neutral and offsets, uh, as many of you would know, are another scam entirely. So we know that this project wasn't nearly as much of a success as the companies claim. Uh, we know that it relies on CCS, which is unproven. We know that it creates huge amounts of emissions. We're looking at about 3.8 million tonnes of emissions, uh, a very climate risky project. And so why on earth is Labor going ahead with it is the key question. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah now to talk a little bit about where the project's up to, and then we'll come back to talk about how we think we can stop it. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so where is the project up to now? We've had the pilot phase, which Ellen has just talked about, that ran from 2018 to 2022. Um, and that involved a bunch of companies that uh, you can see uh, listed on the slide. They include Shell. The state and federal governments also chipped in $50 million each to that pilot project. Um, now the company wants to move to the commercial phase. We um, know that there are a few new companies involved in this phase, and you can see that, um, that they're listed on the slides. There are three components to the commercial phase. Firstly, uh, the bit that Australia is responsible for in the Latrobe Valley, and that's making the hydrogen from brown coal. It's not clear who'll pay for this, but we know that the corporations involve, involved have asked the state and federal governments for money for this. The Japanese government has given a $2.35 billion grant from their so-called Green Innovation Fund to a consortium for the purchase of hydrogen and the liquefaction and shipping elements of the project. In March this year, the Victorian Labor Treasurer actually travelled to Japan to express the Victorian Labor government's support, and that, that was his words, it's been publicly reported, for the project, although no extra money has been committed by the government yet. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we're pleased to see there wasn't any any money in this budget, but we're we're really not sure whether there are any plans to for the government to put any more into this. All of this begs the question: Who is responsible for the carbon capture and storage for this project? Um, that 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 really isn't clear. Who's responsible for the mission for the emissions? We know that the risk and responsibility probably lies with the Victorian government, and therefore with the Victorian people. We'll move to the next slide. So I think, you know, from what we've said, you can see it's a pretty terrible project. Um, analysis by the Australia Institute shows that it'll put 3.8 million tonnes of emissions into the atmosphere, as Ellen has said, and um, which is 
is just insane. <laughs> uh, it extends brown coal mining in Victoria uh, and giving coal a lifeline at a time when we need to be getting out of coal as fast as possible. Um, it's really criminal, I think, in a, in a climate crisis to be finding new uses for dirty brown coal. We've already wasted millions of dollars and years of government action on, on this project. And, you know, sometimes what you'll hear is, that, you know, an argument put up is, um, is that we need to be thinking about um, people who are employed uh, in, in the coal industry. But this is effectively lying to coal workers. Um, and, you know, by propping up a, an industry that is uh, basically obsolete, we are you know, we're lying to them during what is an urgent but difficult transition when we should be doing all we can to transition them to, um, you know, jobs that have a long-term uh, future and that are good for, you know, that are that are um, supporting action on, on climate change, not contributing to it. And carbon capture and storage is a pipe dream. As Ellen has said, uh, the, you know, carbon net, it doesn't exist yet. And uh, the, the claims it's making, it, it has not ever been proven uh, to work on the scale that's proposed anywhere in the world. Um, so it it's really a sham. The really important bit for us on this is that we can win this fight. Um, and that's really important for everyone here to know today. We know that Labor's divided on this. While the Treasurer, Tim Pallas, supports it, the Energy Minister, Lily D'Ambrosio, is against any fossil hydrogen and would actually need to approve the commercial expansion. We know that business, the businesses involved wanted more money from the budget. They asked the Victorian government, but so far they didn't get it. There's an internal fight in Labor about this uh, and we need to be doing everything we can to keep the pressure on so that we push them to rule out any financial support for the project. There's also a dispute over who's responsible for carbon capture and storage. The, Grant that uh, Japan, the Japanese government's put up, that $2.3 billion, only goes to the liquefaction and transport elements of this project. It doesn't cover the carbon capture and storage. So we need to show at every opportunity that carbon capture and storage is a pipe dream. And although the Victorian Labor government's um, supposedly still developing CCS in Victoria, we can make this a dirty word. I'll throw back to Ellen. Thank you so much, Sarah. So what are some of the things that we are doing as the Greens to stop it? And then what are some of the things that you in the community and as supporters can do and NGOs can do? So last, this week, rather, in Parliament, we just finished a sitting week, our last one before the winter break, uh, we introduced our transition away from coal bill. We did that in both houses of Victorian Parliament. And this is a bill that would ban all coal post 2030 in Victoria, increase our renewable energy target, enshrine a ban on coal mining after 2030 in the constitution, similarly to how the Labor government has done that with gas fracking. And importantly, it would stop this project in its tracks. It would ban new uses of coal, which is what this is. We need to be clear, this project is not uh, a nice way to make hydrogen. It, we shouldn't even necessarily call it the hydrogen energy supply chain project because it's that's a long technical term that tries to make it sound fairly benign. What it is, is a new coal project. It is an expansion of coal mining in Victoria. It is giving a lifeline to coal. So that's why we introduced our transition away from coal bill, which would stop this project in its tracks because it does want to exist past 2030. Unfortunately, the Labor government in the lower house voted that down and wouldn't even let it go to a vote in the upper house. But the reason we put it up, the reason that we put this on the agenda is to continue to put pressure on the government. As Sarah said, we know that Labor are internally divided on this, as they should be. You would hope that they would be, that there are some voices that very strongly want to support it and others who are more sceptical. We need to make sure that they hear loud and clear from the community and from uh, political parties to put the pressure on to say this is not going to be popular for you. You cannot give this any more support. It will start to go through a process soon where they will start to seek some of the approvals that Sarah mentioned 
and we need to put pressure on at every one of those moments. We The second tactic that we're doing is to try and force a special debate in Parliament. Now that our bill's been voted down, we can force a special debate on this project. And that's because we actually have this new tactic in Parliament now, a new tactic we haven't had before in the Upper House, where if somebody gets 10,000 signatures on a parliamentary petition, you actually get a special specific debate on that very issue. That's what we're trying to do. So Friends of the Earth have launched this petition and I know Freya Leonard is on the line. So I was going to put you on the spot, Freya, and just ask whether you wanted to talk about your petition at all. Thanks, Ellen. I can give it a red hot go. Um, I've got low internet here. So if I do start to balk out, just, um, just move on without me. Uh, so we did uh, launch a media release yesterday announcing a petition that we are putting to oppose this project. Um, we're um, similar to the work that the Victorian Greens doing, um, absolutely considering this through the new coal project lens. We're also deeply concerned about a carbon capture and storage project of this size at a time when there is not a single um successful project globally and in fact there's a couple of projects that have been held up in Norway as being um, very successful and world's best practice and they are also themselves leaking carbon dioxide even now so uh, there is nothing about this project to recommend you know if we feel like hydrogen has a future in our energy economy in Victoria and if we feel like it's a future export market, then we must be hot footing it towards renewably produced hydrogen. There can be no other way of producing hydrogen at a time of such climate crisis. So I commend uh, the Victorian Greens for really tackling this issue and calling it, for, calling it what it is, another coal project at a time that the planet can't afford another coal project and um, really, really encourage everybody to um, sign the petition, share it with your friends, let everybody know we are in climate crisis and we have not another second to lose. Today and the next best time is today. There is no tomorrow in terms of this. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to that, Ellen. Thank you so much, Freya. And Chris, I'll get you to move to the next slide where people can actually sign the petition. So this is the petition that Freya's talking about that she has sponsored in the Upper House. We've just got a Greens link here because the going you can just go straight to the Victorian Parliament website. It's a, it's a bit longer. So uh, we will put that link in the chat for you now. We need 10,000 people to force a special debate in the Upper House. This is our next moment. If we can get 10,000 people by the start of August, we can force the... Environment Minister who's in the Upper House, the Attorney General, the Agriculture Minister, all of these senior ministers in the Upper House to actually have to get up and defend this project or state their position or feel very uncomfortable in not stating their position and just seeing how much opposition there is in the community. It's a really powerful tactic given that we know that Labor are on the fence about this. Some are supporting it very wholeheartedly, but others are more sceptical. So please sign the petition, share the petition with your networks, anything that you can do to help us get to that 10,000 signature goal in the next five weeks would be fantastic. You can get um, paper petitions. So just get in touch with my office. Amy will put the, the email, but it's office at ellensandal.com if you would like a paper petition to go out into your community. That also counts, but obviously most people prefer to sign it online. We know that we can win because we've actually won before. Many of you on this call were involved in the campaign to stop the gas import terminal at Western Port, which just over a year ago, we were successful in pushing and pushing and pushing and campaigning and getting the government to reject that gas import terminal. Cryo Bay, similarly, there was another gas import terminal proposal for Cryo Bay. The community rallied around. It's been sent off for more studies because it hasn't proven that it is environmentally safe enough to go ahead. So we know this works at, because we've just done it twice. We can do it again. And this is a particularly bad project. So we need everyone to join us. 
in stopping this project and the best way is to sign this petition. We will then let you know when that debate happens and how you can rally support around it. That's all for our briefing. So now we will go to questions. I am just going to open the document where we have been keeping some questions. Um, unless, Sarah, you would like to answer any of them to start with. So there was a, uh, we have a question. Sorry, I've just lost it. Um, so there's a question from Bro about um, where the funding uh, for that pilot had come from and um, whether any of it had come from uh, ARENA um, or the Clean Energy Financing Corporation. Uh, as far as we know, um, that money came directly from the the um, Victorian Labor government and at the time the federal um, coalition government, those the $50 million each. Um, that's that's where we believe it came from. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's my understanding too. It was just it wasn't from Arena or the CFC. It was just a a grant from mm -hmm. the federal coalition government and the Victorian Labor government, fifty million each. Um, and the rest of the money came from, I believe, some of the Japanese companies who were involved who now want to start to commercialize, and they are putting their cap, going cap in hand to the federal and state governments again, asking for money, particularly for the, as we mentioned, there's three stages of this project. So the first part is the part that is in the Latrobe Valley, which is the bit that actually turns the brown coal into hydrogen. The second bit is at the Port of Hastings where it's, they do the liquefaction and then the shipping. Um, and then there's the, the CCS, which is associated with that. So the Japanese government um, and consortium is involved in the second part. The, uh, they're still looking for funding for the first part. Obviously, governments, we don't think, should contribute to projects uh, like this. Some people have asked me, which I think is a very good question, why on earth is the Japanese government doing this? Why are they sinking $2 billion into a project that seems ludicrous? A couple of answers to that. Firstly, Japanese the Japanese government are quite desperate, I think, because they are very energy um, rely, reliant on other countries for their energy. It's very hard for Japan to be energy independent. And so they really, they've got their fingers in pies all over the world, particularly a lot of projects in Australia. They're desperate. They're just trying to throw money at anything to hope something works for them for the future so they're involved in a lot of gas projects in Australia and this one secondly I think that this and this goes to another question that Cass asked is mm. being used as a way to transition to green hydrogen that is an excuse that is being used that if we can set up the infrastructure set up the technology prove that we can ship hydrogen overseas using coal for now but in the future we'll use it to, with green we'll, we'll turn it into green hydrogen i think that that is quite dangerous um partly because well a it creates huge amounts of emissions right um the we don't we can do it using renewable energy we don't need to transition we don't need to use brown coal as a transition and putting 3.8 million tons of carbon dioxide into the air is, is incredibly dangerous. But the other part of that is that the Japanese government puts all the risk onto Victoria and Victorians. So they're the ones who get to have the, 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 the they'll have all the infrastructure around liquefa liquefaction of the hydrogen and exporting it to Japan, the shipping, but the bit that's the coal bit is the bit that actually Victoria will have to fund and Victoria has all the risk of the emissions. It's our responsibility. So we're left with the crap bit yeah. and Japan, the Japanese um, only put their money into the, the no. shipping bit, which they could potentially transition to green hydrogen, but we're left with all the carbon risk. So mm. it's quite dangerous. Mm. Judy, is it? 
Um, so we're just looking at some of these other questions. Can the Victorian Greens use our position in shared balance of power in the upper house to block funding and oppose this project? This is a question from Sam. It's mm. a good question. The thing is, it's unlikely to need legislation. So we can only block things that need legislation. There are mm. many decisions that governments make that are not based in legislation. They're funding decisions, regulations governments make, other decisions that governments make that never actually come before the parliament. Also, a budget cannot be blocked by an upper house. Um, a budget is goes through a lower house. It goes to the upper house, but it can it cannot be blocked by the Victorian upper house. It's different to the Senate rules. So it's unlikely that we will be able to use our balance of power position to block the project as such or block funding as such. But, of course, we can use parliamentary tactics like we are using to force debates to move motions, to require inquiries, um, and also just to, to keep the pressure on. So we are using all of the tactics that we have available to us. Yeah. And I think the thing that will stop this is political pressure rather than necessarily one vote. Do you want to add to that, Sarah? Yeah, the only other thing I'd say is in any situation, our balance of power is really only comes into play as well if the Liberals, uh, for whatever reason, oppose it. Um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a difference between Labor and Liberal on something. Um, so in, in this instance, um, we'd also need the, the Liberals to oppose it. And maybe they would, but <laughs> I, I'm not entirely confident that, that would be the case. Julia from Save Western Port. Hi, thanks for being here and for all your work. Says, what's the new power call that allows you to raise this in the upper house? Did you yeah. say the Greens motion was defeated? Yes. So two things. Firstly, we had a bill this week to try and it was a, quite a comprehensive bill to phase out coal and stop new coal projects. That bill was defeated. But secondly, there's a different tactic that we're trying to use now. I'm not sure exactly what it's called, Sarah might know, but essentially it just means that if you get 10,000 signatures on a petition, yeah. you can force a debate. Yeah, that's essentially all it is. There's a, there is a, a spot in the parliamentary um, sort of sitting week in the upper house um, to debate petitions if anyone has one where they've obtained 10,000 signatures. So it's a new thing. Tim asks, has there been any significant media coverage around this? Uh, strangely, not a huge amount. There yeah. has been a couple of Guardian articles. Um, Chris might be able to dig them out or Amy and put them in the chat. There's also been some good analysis by the Australia Institute, particularly around the pilot project and some of the things that I mentioned before about how it didn't actually create that much hydrogen and the ship caught on fire, all of that. A lot of that uh, is in the Australia Institute work, so you can read a little bit more about it. And they've done some really good work also on why CCS or carbon capture and storage is not a good idea. So we can try and find those links for you and, and chuck them in the chat. Um, Heather asked, do the general public know about the brown coal to hydrogen process? I don't think they do. Not enough. <laughs> that's all of our job, I guess, is to try mm. and make sure that people know about it. And that's the aim of the petition, to mm. make it more public, because I think the government is relying on it just getting through quietly without much fuss. Um, Alan, surely there's a fundamental public safety issue in transporting gaseous hydrogen between the Latrobe Valley and Hastings. Uh, yes, I think um, a lot of people, particularly around who live around the port of Hastings um, and people in Western Port would tell you that safety concerns and people around Cryo Bay, safety concerns were a big part of their opposition to gas import terminals and will be a big part of their opposition to this as well. As I mentioned, there was a fire on the ship to Japan. We're not only shipping this from the Latrobe Valley to the port of Hastings, we're then shipping it across the ocean. So, yes, there are safety issues, but also the biggest safety issue of all is pumping 3.8 million tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, doo -doo -doo. What else have we got here? Um he said, Abigail asked, is there anything else we can do, people we can talk to, actions we can take to raise awareness? Look, anything that you think of, please do it. This is not a fight that we can win on our own. We need community members and the public out there talking to their friends, neighbours, family. If you're a local climate group, talk to them about how bad this is. 
a lot of even local climate groups don't know about it. So please do that um, and please get them to sign the petition. And if you think of other tactics, send them our way. We'd be happy to hear about them or please do, go and do them. Uh, Joy says, does carbon net have to go through any further approvals? Do you want to take that one, Sarah? Uh, so it, carbon net, um, yeah, has a long way to go. It doesn't exist yet. It's, it's you know, it's still being developed. The Victorian governments, you know, um, put it out there as a potential answer to um a lot of our emissions issues, but it doesn't exist yet. So it has a long way to go. Um, and I think that's where it comes in that we need to, um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to put pressure uh, on the government around this issue because it's, you know, I think it's 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 really being used to greenwash a whole lot of projects. Um, sounds really, you know, sounds like it'll be the solution to all our our problems, but when you scratch the surface, there's there's really not much there. Um, it has, as we've said, it hasn't been proven on this scale anywhere, um, and we've got an opportunity now to really, um, you know, to to really get that message through that the community's not buying it, and um, you know, this isn't this isn't going to work. Um, so we, we'll have lots of opportunities. Still has a long way to go. Mm, of course. Um, we've got a few other questions about the politics. So Sam asks, is the Labor government open to deal making where they agree to help pass legislation they like and they scrap this project? Um, look, dealing deal making in the parliament doesn't quite happen like that. It's not necessarily this unrelated piece of legislation in exchange for scrapping this project. Um, it's, a, it's quite a lot more complex than that. Um, the way that we win this is not by just one decision um, or one deal with the government. The way that we win this is the public pressure. Um, it will have to go through a process of looking at it, you know, presumably going through more of an EES. Uh, there's a whole bunch of regulatory approvals that will have to go through that will need the government's tick off, the, the energy ministers, the treasurers tick off if there's any money involved. The way that we win this is by building up such pressure to say that this is a dud, it will be politically bad for them to go ahead with a new project um, and that um, the Labor government then weighs up whether it's worth going ahead with this or not. Um, also putting pressure on at those key moments. So when there is an application, which there's no application yet, but when there is an application for any of those projects, doing what we did with Western Port and Cryo Bay, looking at it, scrutinising it, bringing up the risks, um, and then, you know, hopefully that process knocks it off. But it's it, the Labor, Labor doesn't really work like knock it off in exchange for some unrelated thing. That's not, not quite how the parliamentary process works, mm. despite pressure. There was another question around the politics and about having spoken to um, Labor Hastings MP to get his stance. But I think, you know, it's a good point in that putting pressure on those local members um, where this, you know, where um, where the local community um, is going to be more directly affected um, can be really helpful as well, because when they're feeling the heat, that, that also helps to, I think, um, uh, you know, really get that community message across and um, and feed into um, Labor's stance on this if the if the local members feel like they're under pressure um, mm. because of it. Um, um, so we've got a few other questions. So Heather says, can we put up posters like our rent freeze posters? So that is one tactic that we're absolutely going to do. So we do have some um, no more coal and gas posters going up shortly after the rent freeze posters come down. Um, and if you, Heather, would like to make some posters, put up posters, um, please go ahead. If you're in a local climate group or some other kind of activist group and you want to use some of these tactics, uh, it won't be one just by the Greens alone. We're only a few people as well. Um, but please, if, if, if you're outraged by what you're hearing here, um, 
take the petition, go put up posters, have street stalls, go and do that. Our office can support you with providing the materials if you can go out there and spread the word. Um, Louise had a question about the proposed pipeline. So there was a proposed pipeline for the AGL gas import terminal. Uh, what about the pipeline for this at commercial stage? Um, I'm not aware that they're proposing a pipeline for this. I don't know if um, Chris from my office knows any more, but um, my understanding is it's still just shipping by road. Um, anyway, we'll see. We'll see if Chris has got any more um, on that. And Chris has also just put a link in the chat. Someone had a question about can we provide some more background on the process of the actual technical process of how do you call turn brown coal into hydrogen and how the CO2 is generated? Um, and Chris has put a, a link in there to some of the, the information about that. Just have a look at more of these questions. There was a question about um, the, you know, the potential for this to make the the challenge of mine rehabilitation even a, an even bigger problem. Um, and look, it's it's an issue that is, I think, really starting to, um, you know, we're, we're certainly starting to um, hear quite a bit about, you know, concerns around what are we going to do with all of these big mine pits? The um, proposal for rehabilitation um, in a lot of instances is to fill them with water and that has... Um, you know, some significant impacts on nearby rivers, um, potentially, you know, then with um, downstream effects um, on, uh, you know, places like Gippsland Lake. So, yes, making the whole bigger is going to make that challenge of mine rehabilitation even more significant, particularly if the, the government um, and the, the corporations who are responsible are planning on, on filling them with water. So it is another, it's another part of the problem. You know, it's, a, it's another aspect to why this is so problematic. Mm. And there's just been a bit more information put in the chat, um, particularly from Joy. Thank you that, yes, a pipeline is proposed um, between Lo Yang and Port of Hastings for the commercialisation phase. So that could be a point of uh, quite a bit of contention. Um as it goes to commercialization. I think it's a little way off. Um, this project is proposed to kind of start in the 2030s. Um, so we don't have a huge amount of detail about that, but um, yes, looks like a pipeline may be involved in that. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Um, Chloe asks, where does the environment, the energy minister become a decision maker in proving the commercialisation phase? Um, look, we're working through a lot of that technical detail at this stage. There will be a number of points at which government approvals will be needed. Um, I think the first stage is probably making the project commercial in the first place. So money, they want money. Um, and then it will have to go through a whole step bunch of approvals. Um, we have asked about this several times in the parliament and also um, in budget estimates over the last two weeks, asked the treasurer directly. And he says, no decision has been made. It will have to go through the right process. No decision has been made. But we know that they have given money to the pilot project. And we know that in March, the treasurer went to Japan and stood there and said, I'm providing my government support for this project. So the, technically they haven't given any money and they haven't actually done the tick off of all the steps they need to. And so it technically still is under consideration, but we know that particularly the treasurer is really pushing it behind the scenes. So that's where our pressure comes in. It's that it's trying to knock it off before it even gets to that stage by showing the huge community opposition to it and the, the ludicrous nature of a project which continues the life of brown coal in this state and just show them how how unpopular and what a bad idea that would be. Mm. So if there's no more questions, we might leave it there. Thank you everyone for participating today. It's really good to see all your faces, particularly people we've worked so closely with um, on 
Western Port on Cryo Bay and any number of other projects. I know many of you are involved in XR, your local climate groups, Save Western Port, all of those groups. So please take this information, share it with all of the people that you work with. If you do need any resources such as um, if you need these slides, if you need any of the technical information, Chris in my office is more than happy to help you. Their email address is chris at ellensandal.com. I'm sure that they'll put it in the chat. And please share the petition. That is our next um, point. Um, that's that's the bit at which we will um, be really putting the pressure on. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, if there are also any other questions that we haven't asked, um, please feel free to shoot them through on email and we'll get back to you. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, your weekend.